Guys, I have a confession to make. I actually don't like being scared. I've played and endured so many different horror games and experiences that it might seem hard to believe, but really, I don't like being scared. That being said, I love horror games. I love the horror genre. I love the emotions that they make you feel as a player and as a viewer. But Mr. Iroh, fear is an emotion that comes from being scared, and you just said you didn't like being afraid. Well, to that I say, shut the f*** up this is my video i used to be too afraid to even look at a horror game let alone move my thumbs to control a character in one but the older i got the more willing i was to actually engage with the genre and it all started with watching my parents play resident evil now with how far graphics and vr have come it's pretty hard to imagine getting scared by old polygon jane over here but trust me in the early 2000s this shit was nightmare fuel my riddling addled elementary school brain hyper focused on every minute detail of these games the loud tap of your footsteps as you walk down a long dark hallway. The way the fixed camera angle showed you just enough that you have a vague idea of what was going on, but not enough to make you feel comfortable that you're not running right into Nemesis. That special backing up animation that your character has when a zombie is right in front of them, like, chill, you're not supposed to be afraid right now, I'm supposed to be afraid, and you're supposed to stay strong, we cannot both be in crybaby bitch mode right now. Classic Resident Evil was able to elicit all of these emotions in me back in the 90s when Jill still had Laura Croft titties. And as a kid, I was intrigued enough to want to watch, but not enough to want to actually play it. So you can imagine my surprise when on my 11th birthday, I got the new and improved Resident Evil remake for my GameCube. I also got Double Dash, that was pretty rad. This game ruined me as a child, like it legitimately scarred me. I had a period of my childhood where I had really bad night terrors and it legitimately made me afraid to go to bed because I knew that I had some fucked up Tsukiyomi ass genjutsu waiting for me whenever I fell asleep. This affected how I consumed media for like a solid six years. Because anything scary that I encountered in the daytime could be warped into my worst nightmare come nighttime. That being said, it's time to discuss one of my other biggest childhood fears, zombies. It's an irrational fear that I still have remnants of today. The thought of being overwhelmed by hordes of people or something that's not quite human but still humanoid and getting gruesomely eaten alive is something that my brain really does not like even if it's in fiction. That's also why instead of showing footage of something like that to further articulate the point as I'm talking about it, I've been showing footage of ESPN and NFL 2K5. Side note, there's this baller ass mod that updates the rosters and all the artwork to look more current called 2K20. 23 and I don't even know what the f Madden is anymore. You thought I wouldn't find a way to talk about 2k5 in every single video? I keep that mother on me. I'm sorry game. I will never hurt you again. So I have really bad nightmares as a kid and I'm really afraid of zombies as a kid. So maybe getting an 11 year old Resident Evil remake wasn't the best idea after all. I booted the game up and I could barely get past the intro cutscene where the guy gets mauled by the dogs. But what really sent me over the edge was the franchise's most iconic moment, the first zombie reveal. Yeah, fucking shambles McGee over here was beating my ass back in the day. The zombies in Remake already have a really deep health pool, but I swear to God, they made this guy basically invincible. No matter how many times I shot this guy, he just would not go down. And after he grabbed me for like the third time in a row, I just put the controller down and walked away. The icing on the cake is that the guy that's getting eaten by the first zombie is named Kenneth and like whatever funny, oh my God, they killed Kenny. But like, that's my name. And the message that I got from that was that this game is going to f***ing kill you and you shouldn't play it. So how did I get to where I am now? A guy who loves horror games and actively seeks out scary experiences. While I think a big part of it was just me getting older, I really think the biggest portion of it was my willingness to actually engage with what scared me and face it head on. For the longest time, I would only play Resident Evil 4 and not the others because that one was way less scary but most importantly didn't have any zombies in it. But I eventually sucked it up and played the remake and that was a really big milestone for me. Because in my mind, if I could face that, I could face any game. That led me to trying out games like Outlast, Amnesia, Silent Hill, VR games like Dread Halls and Alien Isolation. By just facing the fear of Resident Evil 1, an entire world of horror games was just open to me now. And fast forward to today, I've played so many horror games that I really feel like they're not scaring me like they used to. And that, 
has me very conflicted. Now, when I say the games don't scare me like they used to, I'm not saying that they don't get a reaction out of me. Lord knows I got plenty of that going on. But at some point, just getting jump scared over and over and over just makes you go numb to it all. And honestly, I'm still trying to figure out if that's because horror games just suck nowadays, or if my brain is just turned into goo from over a decade of Freddy Fazbear dancing on my grave. And in that quest to figure that out, I found a few examples of games that really did manage to get a good fear response out of me. So we're gonna look at those examples and see exactly why they were so effective. So get ready, dial it up, lock it in, strap it on, rub it out, because this is gonna be one him haul of a hoot nanny. So by now you know my history with Resident Evil and how it shaped my outlook on horror games. And the franchise has more iconic moments than I can count on all three of my hands, like the first zombie, Nemesis crashing through a window, the dogs crashing through a window, those crows crashing through a window. Shit, I think Leon does it a couple times too. But for me, the scariest moment in all of Resident Evil comes in Resident Evil 4. Now that may sound crazy because RE4 was the beginning of these games becoming less scary, but if you stick with me, I promise it'll all make sense. Resident Evil 4 was the one Resident Evil game I was comfortable playing because it wasn't as scary. The atmosphere is much different. A good portion of it occurs during the day. You had way more attack options, but most importantly, there weren't any zombies. My fear of zombies wasn't an issue in Resident Evil 4 because this game's enemies, the Ganados, were just regular people. Sure, they were infected, but they still communicated and used tools like regular people do. RE4 still has its moments of horror, but it's more of like a tension and overwhelming force thing than a dread and terror thing. So I go through all of Resident Evil 4, feeling like a badass, having the time of my life, and then I get to the island. At the very beginning, it's a normal section of the game with different looking Ganados and a new mini boss, JJ. He's a big guy with a big gun and God damn it, not Jimmy Walker. JJ doesn't scare me at all. Oh, this is the same thing that made RE5 and 6 less scary for me. If you ever want to make a horror game less scary, give the enemies guns. Works like a f***ing charm. So I breeze through this section like normal, and at this point, my mind is on cruise control mode. This is the last major section of the game, and while there have been some interesting mini-bosses up to this point, they've been nothing that I couldn't handle. Maybe the Garador was pretty creepy, but, you know, once you get past one or two of them, it's not that big of a deal. So when I saw JJ, I was like, alright, it's the last section of the game, we're going complete action game mode and what little horror this game had is completely gone. When in reality, does he know? No more than 20 minutes into this section, you come across this lab with these automatic sliding doors, very reminiscent of the older games. When you enter, you see this gray bastard on a table in the next room, and hold on, I think he just shit my pants. You pick up the key card in the other room, and then you hear the sound of a door breaking down, and then the music starts and then the breathing starts. And if you're like me, you're too afraid to go outside and see what it is, but that's just fine, he just lets himself no, right on it. This is the Regenerator. He's tall, gray, and human-like, but clearly not human, at least not anymore. It has razor-sharp teeth and eyes that nobody's mother could love. Now, initially, I had no idea what this guy was or what moves it knew, but I knew I didn't want it anywhere near me. So I did what just about everybody else does, and I started blasting, and nothing that I did would work. Shotgun shells to the head, nothing. But one of those shotgun shots just so happened to hit him in the leg, and it blew the leg off, and then this mother proceeds to Michael Phelps swim move Lambo leap right on top of me and starts eating my face. Blessed be the rock. This is a zombie. Red alert. That was not part of the script. Mom, mom. This enemy is so effective because it takes everything that you know about Resident Evil 4 up to that point and throws it completely away. Leon in RE4 is the most broken a pro tag has ever been in these games up to that point. And the game before it had Jill Valentine in it. Leon Leon's like the ultimate badass, like he can kick crowds of people and fucking Brock Lesnar suplex dudes and do backflips and shit and the regenerator just doesn't give a fuck about any of that. No matter how much you shoot it or where you shoot it, it just keeps coming at you. It regenerates its limbs and comes back even stronger and faster, which is not good for you at all. Eventually you get a thermal scope for your sniper rifle and you see that the correct way to kill them is to shoot these very specific parasites that's inside of their body and that makes them way easier to deal with. But you run into three of them before you even get that scope and I love that they do this. This section of the game 
game completely strips you of that powerful protagonist feeling that you had as Leon, and unless you have a shit ton of ammo, you likely wasted it all on the first regenerator. You can eventually kill it if you shoot it enough, but the amount of regular bullets that it'll take if your weapons aren't like super upgraded is ridiculous ridiculously high. It's a very stark reminder that you're not as strong as you think you are, even this deep into this game's campaign, when you're the most comfortable with the mechanics. This moment is absolutely perfect, and considering everything I talked about at the beginning of this video, you can understand why it really stuck with me. For the longest time, I didn't even finish Resident Evil 4 because of regenerators. They were like a legitimate roadblock for me. I really could not stand the thought of having to face one more of these things, and I just completely put the game down for a while. RE4 is the best in the franchise for a reason and its horror elements are severely slept on. Outlast is a franchise that doesn't do too much or show you too much in terms of interesting gameplay mechanics, but what it does show you it is very effective at. The core gameplay revolves around you being chased by enemies that overpower you and analyzing your surroundings so that you can find places to run and hide effectively. Sometimes I think the game relies on this whole getting chased aspect a little too much, but like I said, it does it well. Now Outlast has a lot of different mangled looking bastards that you have to run from, the most iconic of them being Chris Walker or as I like to call him big nigga, but if we're talking about moments that really stuck with me, it would be the encounter with Dr. Traeger. Take one look at Edward Scissorman over here, and he looks just as fucked up as all the other baddies in this game. Although he is the only one that walks around showing a bunch of booty ass. But it's his attitude that really does it for me. He speaks with so much lighthearted sarcasm, all with a passive tone, while looking like a deranged serial killer. Apparently he used to work at the asylum when the first experiments were happening, and in his mind, he still does. His actions and his words don't really align properly, at least not in tone. He just nonchalantly slices your fingers off and just oh so casually gores a patient strapped to a table like he's asking you to pass the napkins. He speaks to you like you're a business partner or like he's your boss, always referring to you as buddy and talking about how he hates quitters and how you have to dedicate yourself to the project. The gameplay of this section isn't anything special by Outlast standards, it's just like doing a couple puzzles and trying to hide from him, but there are two big elements of it that really stand out to me. The first of which being the dialogue that you get while you're running away and hiding from Traeger, especially when it's quiet and you don't know where he is, and from behind you you just hear, Hold up there, buddy. It's just so scary to hear that line delivered in that way from a guy who's coming at you full speed with giant scissors, and did I forget to mention his butt is out? The second is the fact that if not for Dr. Traeger, you would have easily been able to escape the asylum. One thing I love about this game is how realistic the beginning moments are. Your first objective is to infiltrate the asylum and get footage of all the fucked up stuff that's going on because you got a tip from a whistleblower and the world has to know what's happening in that building. And that harrowing journey to find the truth and expose corruption lasts for all of about four minutes until you meet Dingleberry Jones over here with an entire pole up his ass in a room full of severed heads and the objective immediately flips to Get the fuck out of here. I love how they don't use some fake ass quest for justice as the driving force of the story. Miles is in way over his head and he makes a bad decision and immediately realizes that he needs to leave. The entire game is Miles trying his damnedest to leave, but just getting stopped at every turn. When Traeger first captures you, he straps you to a wheelchair and walks you right by the wide open front door that you were just about to head to. He even taunts you as he knows that you can't make it out. And even after his encounter, when you get the elevator key and start to ride the elevator to freedom, Traeger tries to enter the elevator as it's moving between floors and it crushes his back, killing him, but blocking your path to the exit again. Even in death, Traeger mocks you and impedes your progress. This is the closest that Miles would ever get to escaping the asylum, and spoiler alert, I mean, game's pretty old, but I mean, I guess, yeah, spoiler alert, okay, everybody gone, okay, you ready? Miles fucking dies. That one tip from the whistleblower that got him to go into the asylum that he immediately realized was a bad decision was enough for him to be doomed. And when I look back at the entire game and think about why Miles never made it out of that asylum, I always come back to this encounter with Traeger because you were literally right there, and at both instances he stops you, even as he fucking dies. And that implication, along with being chased by a guy who's still coherent enough to speak fluently and intelligently, but still unhinged enough to chase you around with some giant fucking hedge clippers, is a fear that still gives me chills to this day, so... Good on you, Outlast. All right, this last example is gonna be a bit controversial, but bear with me, okay? 
All right, I'm about to talk about Five Nights at Freddy's, so you know what that means. We gotta break out the Keisha Cole bonnet. Okay, before you guys start air juggling me in the comments, all right, just give me a sec. I got something to say. Five Nights at Freddy's is an iconic horror game. I know, yeah, I said it. Yeah, that's all right. I said, yeah, okay, hey, but can I talk? Can I explain myself? Can I talk? Fellas, can I talk? All right, all right, now peep this one. When I say that FNAF is iconic, I specifically mean the first one. I do enjoy the other ones, and I think they're pretty good horror games too, but the first one specifically, under all the right circumstances, is one of the best horror experiences I've ever had. Five Nights at Freddy's gets a bad reputation for a lot of reasons, and I'll save that for another video. The biggest criticism that the game got on release that it kind of still gets today is that it was a bit of a one-trick pony. The game's main draw was the jump scares, which do get a bit old after a while but just calling it a jump scare simulator really doesn't do it justice and it doesn't give credit to the crazy amount of atmosphere that these games have and it's crazy how these games can have such great atmosphere working with so little FNAF's horror is definitely running on borrowed time but what it does with that time is very effective this game plays on your fear of the unknown and sets you up perfectly to make all the wrong decisions so that when you do get jump scared it's really effective this game works best when you go into it with no prior knowledge of how it works or what to do. Right off the bat, you're thrown into this dark, dank office with no options to run or hide, but only to keep the bad guys out. The gameplay's mechanics are pretty simple. Check the doors to see if anything gets close and then close them whenever they do. Nice place, nigga. However, this game lulls you into a false sense of security by making you think that the camera is the most important aspect of the game, when in fact the opposite is true. The animatronics that are the most aggressive during the first couple nights are Bonnie and Chica, and they're also the ones who can only jump scare you if you're in the camera. And this is not an accident at all. You'll know that they're about to attack if you see them when you press your door lights and the little music plays. However, most brand new players will most likely be really attached to the camera and that makes a lot of sense. Being in the camera can feel like a bit of a comfort zone because it seemingly has all of the information that you need and it's a lot better than just staring at that creepy ass desk fan in those dark hallways. If you're following the animatronics as they get closer to the door, you might instinctively close it once you see that they're in the room that's closest to your door and then open it up again once you see that they've left. Then you go on the camera to find them again and then you realize that they're not there anymore. You're checking every room and you still don't find them but then you hear this weird ass moaning sound. You flip the camera down and then... This jump scare by itself really doesn't seem like a lot, but combined with the growing tension of not knowing when it's coming or how to stop it really puts it all together. Five Nights at Freddy's is at its best when you're going through the process of figuring out how to survive. You find comfort in being in the camera and that's exactly what the game wants you to do. It's no coincidence that the main and most aggressive attackers can only get you while you're in the camera. During that scenario, the correct option would be to check the door lights and then close the doors once you see them. And I don't know why but for some reason most new players really don't check the door lights that often and if they do they check the door lights much less than they check the camera and I would know because this is exactly what I did the first time I played it and back when the game first came out when I had my friends play it they all did the same thing too so getting jump scared your first time in FNAF is pretty good but we're not done just yet there's one more moment that if everything aligns properly and happens exactly how it should I think it's one of the most iconic horror game moments in history one thing that this game establishes very early on is that you're not going to see any actual movement of the animatronics in the cameras. They're all just still pictures that move off screen when the camera glitches. And this makes it a lot harder to track where they actually are. That sounds simple enough, but there's one animatronic that throws a wrench in that entire plan. Foxy. Foxy doesn't move from room to room, but he slowly tries to get out of his room as time goes on. This is shown by him moving further and further off the stage, and then at some point just completely being off of it looking poised to run down the hall. Foxy's room connects to the hallway that leads right to your room. So when you check the cameras and Foxy's not there anymore, your very first instinct is probably to close the door, gotta be honest. But if you think to check where he is in the camera, the most likely spot would be the hall that's right underneath his room. So when you check it, I don't know about you, but of all the moments in this franchise, I will never forget the first time I saw Foxy running down that hall. The game sets an expectation, you get used to it, and then it completely goes against it. You never see 
any character animation except for the jump scares and you expect all the movement to occur off screen. They all move like they're ghosts, almost like they just apparate into each room. But no, they're moving like normal and Foxy is coming right at you. Five Nights at Freddy's is a game that does eventually lose its mystique, especially once you figure out how to play it, because that fear of the unknown will quickly turn into anger at not getting the execution right. It heavily relies on your ignorance and your fear of not knowing what to do. It does still have a couple more tricks up its sleeve, like Golden Freddy randomly popping up, or the fact that Freddy can come through the door and jump scare you even if you don't have the camera up. But once that happens, it really doesn't have too much to show you after that, and the criticism that this game gets that it loses its luster too soon is definitely well earned. But when it works, and you're completely in the dark, it's one of the better horror game experiences out there, and it definitely, it least deserves to be a part of the conversation with all the others. Seriously, this may seem like one big meme, but back in 2014 when this was just some random indie horror game and there weren't all the sequels and prequels and Funko Pops and movies that'll never come out and male impreg in the book? Scott, my brother and God, what the fuck type times you on right now? This shit just hit different back in 2014 when nobody knew what this was and it's definitely one of the most fond gaming memories I've ever had. Let alone for a horror game. All in all, I still don't know why horror games aren't really hitting the way they used to, but it is good to go back and see what used to work in the past, and I hope that some of that stuff worked for you too, like maybe some of these examples are things that you could relate to as well. And maybe leave a comment about a horror game moment that really stuck with you, I don't know, fucking free country, it's not up, it's not up to me! Alright, I really don't know how to end the video, so uh, I'm just gonna, just gonna, uh, I don't know. Play 2K5. Leave a 2K5 in the comments if you're one of the real ones out there. Okay, bye.